<clears throat> so our first uh, uh, instructors for this session are Peter Borman and Johannes Buchner. You may have heard Johannes give an invited talk. I think that was almost two weeks ago. <laughs> um, and uh, on this Bayesian X-ray analysis uh, technique and methods, and Peter Borman, I believe, is going to give us a presentation about this. Uh, so take it away, Peter. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So. Uh... So the, the original idea was to make this as hands-on as possible, right? Um, but I just thought it would help just to um, bring some things together, just to have a very, very, very brief uh, introduction just with a few slides, um, just so we know what's going on. Um, so, uh, oh. yeah. So first off, I just wanted to briefly um, introduce myself, right? Since everyone has uh, introduced themselves on, on the chat, I just wanted to show uh, why I use BXA, what I'm particularly interested in. So um, for those of you who don't know about AGN, um, here's a sort of simplified schematic of a, a typical AGN geometry, um, where we have uh, the supermassive black hole at the center and an accretion disk accreting material and uh, some sort of X-ray source, very, very close to the supermassive black hole, very compact. And I'm very interested in the, the X-ray Compton scattering um, and absorption that goes on in this distant obscure, sort of 10 to 100 parsecs away. Right? And this is the typical spectrum that you get for, uh, for different um, line of sight column densities. So this equivalent hydrogen column density that you see, this NH. Um, and uh, in particular, I'm very interested in knowing what the average column density is uh, for all AGM. Right. Um, so a simple uh, sort of science question that might sound, it can be quite tricky computationally. OK, so the first uh, tricky bit is that there are many, many models for uh, torus geometries. OK, for the, this obscura. Um, and I saw a few people are working on um, torus obscuration and things like that in, in AGM. So that's that's great. Um, but so the uh, the different geometric degrees of freedom can be very hard to, to model and then to quantifiably say if one model is preferred over another. And so that's why I use BXA um, for this, this idea of model comparison, but then also uh, the ability to fit spectra, such as in this plot, I'm fitting uh, three spectra simultaneously in the same session, um, much like you would say in XPEC if you were doing data 1.1, one, one, data 2.2. Two, two. Um, you can do that with BXA. And uh, what's particularly useful is, um, as Johannes covered very nicely in his, uh, in his talk about two weeks ago, um, you can uh, effectively avoid issues with local minima because you're taking this global uh, view of the parameter space and then condensing down into the parameter regions that you're, you're interested in. Um, this lower panel here on this diagram, this is showing a slightly different approach to residuals. So this is a quantile quantile plots. And uh, there is an exercise for that um, a little bit later on, but very briefly, it's basically showing the cumulative distribution of the data uh, versus the cumulative distribution of the counts. But then all I've done is just subtracted those two axes. So a perfect fit on these plots would be a, a horizontal line. Okay. And then depending on what side of the line you're on, you have either a data excess or a model excess. And based on that, you can then tweak your model um, accordingly. Okay. If it's too complex or not complex enough. Okay. Okay. Um, and then in the last session, one thing we're going to be covering is this uh, ability of combining individual source posteriors to derive a population distribution from a sample. Okay, um, so as I said earlier, I'm interested in finding out in a sample of AGM what the column density distribution uh, is, right? Um, but that can be quite difficult if you fit uh, and you have individual posteriors with individual degeneracies, maybe multiple modes. To be able to combine those can be quite uh, a difficult task. And so there are some very cool uh, tools out there that you can use in combination with um, posteriors that you get from BXA to uh, produce uh, population distribution. And that's what we're going to be uh, uh, discussing in a bit more detail tomorrow. So in terms of the outlines, uh, so um, uh, yeah, if it's if it is needed, uh, I can quickly go over a few quick uh, commands in Sherpa and PyXpec to sort of load data and to 
uh, fit a model inside a, a Sherpa or a PyX spec a window. Um, the actual commands are covered in the exercises on the, the URL, which I'll, I'll show in a, in a moment. Um, but yeah, if people need uh, more of an introduction to that, I'm happy to, to do that. Um, but then the, the bulk of the session is sort of planned to be uh, breakout rooms to work on the exercises. Um, and then me and uh, Johannes can go around um, if anyone has any questions or any issues, maybe with the uh, the installation or the setup or Python versions or anything like that, um, we can also help with that too. Um, and then, yeah, the last sort of more than 10 minutes, uh, we were probably gonna spend discussing uh, any issues, any questions that anybody has um, in the moment. And then, yeah, that'll be the, the session. Um, as far as the second session is concerned, uh, I really wanted to reserve sort of the first chunk of the session for any questions that people were able to think about, you know, um, away from the session um, in their own time. Uh, so yeah, we'll have just a, a chunk of time just for anyone to, to ask any questions that they might have, uh, that they might have been able to, to, to think of. Um, and then for maybe just, just a short sort of 15 to 20 minutes, I'll go over a presentation on some slight, slightly more advanced concepts um, that typically require just a little bit more computation time. Um, there will also be exercises that I'm still working on now, but uh, they will be on the, the same web link um, uh, to, to do this. Um, and they will, the, the exercises will probably take a little bit longer than an hour session. Uh, so we probably won't have enough time to, to cover all of the exercises. Um, this is also probably true for today's session. Um, but if anyone does have uh, any comments or any queries or anything like that, please do just drop me an email. I'm more than happy to uh, tweak any typos you find, anything like that. Um, yeah, please do just let me know. Um, yes, and then the, the last example that we were gonna work through tomorrow uh, was probably gonna be the first exercise for the, the second session on the URL, which is all about creating these population distributions from individual posteriors. Okay, uh, so I kind of rattled through that a bit quickly, but does anyone have uh, any questions on that? Anything at all? Uh, and any, everyone, if you have a question, if it's just, if we're not having a lot of questions and you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask it. If we're having a lot of questions, we'll start using the raise hand feature to make sure everyone gets uh, asked in order. Looks like no questions, Peter. <laughs> yeah, if there are if there are no questions, then uh, if anyone doesn't have it, this is the URL with the with the exercises on. Um, I would say also if uh, at some point I'm doing some coding or anything and it doesn't appear or anything like that, please do just warn me. Uh, this is the first time I'm actually working simultaneously on two machines during a presentation, so I'll probably be just using the wrong keyboard or something like that. But yeah, please do shout out and tell me. Um, but okay, yeah, so uh, as far as the breakout rooms are concerned, or actually, yeah, um, would anyone like me to go through briefly sort of Sherpa commands uh, or PyExpert commands, just very sort of basic ones to start with, or they are also included in the, the session one section of the, the exercises, or would people just like to just plow on and get on with the exercises? I think we do have a lot of people who expressed uh, interest in doing the Sherpa session, which is not until right. Wednesday. So that might be helpful to give us a, a brief overview. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, okay, so uh, so I've installed Sherpa with uh, Conda environment. So I'm just gonna activate that. Um, and then by running Sherpa, it's got its own IPython. Uh, one there and then just on the website if you scroll down or click on the session one getting started um so it's got uh, the data to download for this session uh so you just click on where it says from here um it should download and then if you change to that directory so that you have the the data files in there um then uh yeah then if you activate chow and then sherpa um 
And yeah, the first thing is probably a good idea to, well, for this session, we're going to be importing uh, bxa.sherpa as bxa. By the way, if anyone doesn't want to be using Sherpa but would rather use uh, PyXBEC, then yeah, please just go ahead and start the, the exercises. Uh, this is purely for just the, the Sherpa commands. If you want some PyXBEC commands, I can also go over that as well. So to use the to use BXA, you uh, need to use the Poisson statistic instead of chi squared. So the the first thing um, to do would be to not that simple. So if you do uh, set stats uh, W statistics. So what this is is modified C statistics. Okay, and there's a link on the uh, useful links part of the the exercises um, for anyone that doesn't know about W statistics. But basically, it's where instead of having your own background model, um, it automatically loads a background model that it's a stepwise function that has uh, a number of parameters that equals the number of bins in the model. Okay, And by doing that, you avoid this uh, the need for having a specific background model, um, but it does require some sort of minimal binning, which is what I've done on the, the simulated data that you downloaded for this, for this exercise. Okay. Um, so yeah, we... Hopefully that can work. Yeah. So if we set, set the statistic there, um, then also for any uh, plots or analysis that we uh, use, we will probably, just for this session, we'll probably want it in energy instead of channels. Um, so we would do set analysis uh, there. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's mainly the, the setup that we'll need for the first few exercises. Um, now, in terms of loading a spectrum, so if we, we just want to load this, load this one Chandra spectrum, um, what we would do is uh, load PHA, um, assign it to ID1. Uh, ideally, it would be zero, but I'm just doing that to match, I believe, the expert notation starts from one for spectra, from like one, one, two, two, et cetera. Um, and then uh, the name of the file, which that one, yep. And so uh, it shows you that the the effective area and the response, as well as the background file, have been loaded in correctly, just because they were in the header of the file. Um, then, if we just ignore the relevant energy regions for this particular spectrum, so for the Chandra, it would be uh, uh, sorry, zero to zero point five in energy space, then in KV, um, and then eight. KV to the end of the spectrum. So we can just leave that blank. Um, and we need to specify the ID as well uh, to say which one we're, we're ignoring over. Um, okay. And then in terms of a model, you can just generate a pretty simple model and just call it excess power law. Uh, so in Sherpa, when it has XS at the front, it basically means that it's an equivalent of an XPEC model. Um, and a very cool feature you can do is you do dots and then give it a name for your model. So if you do uh, MyPal, for instance, um, I think that's what I did in the example. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then, so now you have this model, but you need to actually tell Sherpa that this model is to be assigned to the corresponding data set. So you would do set source or set source model um, on ID1 and you would do my mod there. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I think there's a typo in the instructions. It doesn't have the ID, um, which I don't know if that would work. Um, yeah, and then in terms of changing the parameters of your model. So for a power law, the, the parameters are the photon index and the normalization. So uh, for Sherpa, the main command is set par. Um, so my power, which is what we called it, dot, uh, so the photon index is the first parameter. Um, val equals, we could just say two, which is a pretty good guess for an AGN typically. Um, and then uh, the min we would set uh, here would probably be minus three, max would be plus three. Um, and we could just go from there. And then similarly for the, for the normalization. Um, and yeah, that's basically the, for the BXA commands, that's really the, the only sort of introduction 
you probably need. We just declare that just to make it a bit clearer. Um, okay, so with PyXpec, it's just a little bit different, but uh, the, all the commands that we input are for the same effect, right? Um, so first, just because we only, we've only initiated a, an IPython window, so uh, we want to import XPEC so that we can use PyXpec, right? Um, we also want to import the BXA part or the, the expect part of BXA as well. Okay. Um, to change to W statistics, so modify C statistics uh, in expect uh, C statistics where you don't have a background model are automatically W statistics. Okay. So what we would do is uh, fit dot stat method equals uh, C stat, I think. Yeah. Uh, then changing the uh, from channels to energy is just for plots, I think. So you would do, uh, for instance, this sort of thing. But there are also you can change to different units if you uh, if you prefer. Um, now for uh, for PyXpec, uh, if you want to use um, a plotting device like you would in regular XPEC in terminal. Uh, you just do plot.device equals instead of you know cpd that you might be familiar with um, in terminal. Um, and so the same commands work, but it has to be a string. So you would do slash xw if that's what you're used to, or um, I think other ones like slash xs maybe. Um, and that'll bring up a, a window. Um, you won't have been able to see the window that came up because I'm only showing terminal, <laughs> but it did come up. Um, then that's yes. So in terms of the setup, that's the main sort of setup that we do. Um, then for loading individual spectra, you can do s equals uh, spectrum. This one. How you would uh, load a spectrum into the first uh, data set. Um, <clears throat> then in terms of ignore, it's just a slightly different command to, to Sherpa. So it's just uh, s. So it's the spectrum dot dot ignore. It keeps going. There we go. Uh, and it's the same syntax that you would use in the terminal. Um, geez. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, in terms of a model, again, it's just slightly different. So it's just my mod equals, uh, and the the main thing is the capital M model, and then in uh, brackets. This time, if we just wanted the power law, we would just do power law and it prints out to show you that that's what you've got um, and then there are various different ways to change the parameters one way is to do the name of your model so it was my mod uh, dot power law dot in this case low index values equals um, and the uh, the order of this uh, kind of matters so um, the first number is the value the next number is the delta used in a local fit. So this is this this number doesn't matter for BXA. This would be used for the Liebenberg Markov algorithm, I believe. Um, and then the the minimum. So here that would be minus three. The the next number is the sort of soft minimum. So it's often called the, the bottom in XPEC, the bottom parameter. Um, but here it's just we're just going to set it to the same value as the hard minimum. Um, and then the soft maximum or the, the top value, we're going to set to the hard maximum as well, which is 3, comma 3. Okay. Again, like uh, if uh, if you are new to this, um, don't worry. This is all included on the the uh, breakdown at the, the start of the exercises. Um, so that's set the, the photon index. Um, and that's all I think you need to know before the, the first exercise. Okay, so on the, the web page, so if we do uh, exercise 1.1, so this is all about prior predictive checks. Okay, so the thing uh, that's powerful about the XA is that you can fit from a predefined global parameter space. 
Okay, but uh, you have to, or it's good practice to check that the prior parameter space that you defined uh, makes sense for the, the data that you have. Right? So for instance, for this data, it's a relatively, relatively faint in terms of the intrinsic source flux. So if we were to set the power law normalization to a prior between um, 10,000 and 100,000, uh, then that would be um, a bit silly, right? Because um, on the, the y-axis, if you plot the, the data, it's clear that the, the normalization should be a lot lower than that. Right? Um, so it probably doesn't make you know <laughs> a lot of sense to do that here, but it's just uh, an example. Um, and for more complex models, it would be very, it is very, very useful to uh, effectively plot um, the uh, the spectrum that you get for a, a, just a selection of values from the prior, just to see if the, the priors make sense. Okay, so just because I have PyXPEC open and every time I change terminal tab, I have to reshare my screen, I will uh, do this one from PyXPEC. I hope that's okay. Um, I have included the PyXPEC and Sherpa commands for everything on the exercises. So uh, if you would rather have Sherpa, then yeah, please do just, just look at those. So for uh, here, so the first thing we, we're gonna want to do is we've set reasonable parameter ranges for um, the, the photon index, right? So the next thing we wanna do is we're gonna set reasonable parameter ranges for the, uh, the normalization, right? So the, the one remaining parameter that we've got. So what we would do is we would say my, not, my mod .power law .norm values. Uh, Equals. So uh, a first guess that we can do uh, from the plot of the data. Um, oh yes, just so you know, uh, I sort of skipped past it just because um, you can't see my <laughs> plotting window, but plot commands in XPEC or in PyXPEC, um, if you want just regular ones that you would get an equivalent of just uh, XPEC, then uh, the command is just capital P plot like this. Um, and then the equivalent you know, um, command that you would do in XPEC. So for, this, for instance, um, this time we would do plot L data um, and we, we would, well, you, you should get a, a window up, right? Where the, the spectrum is sort of on a level of say, I don't know, 0.01 on the, uh, on the, the, the plot, okay? So that kind of tells you um, that the normalization should be, you know, within that sort of range. Um, so what we can do is we can do uh, mymod.powerlaw.norm.values equals, uh, so one, let's just say one e minus three for the value. So this is just the initial value of the parameter. And this doesn't actually matter for VXA, because as we said, it doesn't start in one position in the parameter space. It starts in a range defined by your prior, right? So the, the key things that we're gonna to want to change are not this number either. So that's just the delta. I'm just putting that in just in case it throws up a, a warning or an error. Um, but the, the main numbers are, so this number, right? So the first is the hard minimum. So that's gonna be uh, gonna set that to arbitrarily very low value relative to our spectrum. So let's just say one e minus eight. Um, then the soft minimum, which we're gonna to set to the same value just for now, but that doesn't really matter because like I said, for BXA, it only needs the hard minimum and the hard maximum. Um, and then we're going to set the uh, max to one and uh, one. Okay. So do that. Um, okay. So that's defined your parameter ranges. But now the, the next step in BXA is that you're going to want to define your uh, priors. Okay. So uh, the prior transformations um, that in, in, so yeah, in PyXPEC, you feed in prior transformations in Sherpa um, with uh, BXA, you feed in the, the priors or a global prior function that you create from your individual priors, as well as a list of your parameter values okay. um, or your parameters even. So here we're gonna just define transformations uh, equals and we're going to define a list so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a uniform oops, a uniform prior for the uh, first component so the first um, value that goes into this is the model so that's my mod and then the parameter itself okay so that's going to be my mod dot index okay 
that's the first value in the list. Then the uh, the reason we've uh, here, um, yeah. So actually, yeah, I should explain. In the online uh, exercises, I have said that uh, you can assume that the power law photon index is a Gaussian, right? So alternatively, if you didn't want to use just a uniform prior, so just a non-informative prior, you could also um, you can also just change that to Gaussian there. And the only difference is that you would also put uh, that there. Um, but then the next value is going to be the mean of this Gaussian, right? So uh, I think mine, I said 1.9. I can't quite remember, but it probably doesn't matter right now. Um, and then a spread of, say, 0 0.15. Okay, and that will create a Gaussian prior. Then uh, for the normalization, because the normalization, we designed it to spread from 1e minus 8 up to 1, it covers a lot of orders of magnitude. Then the appropriate prior there, if you don't want to have an informative prior, is just to have a, a non informative prior but over log space. Okay, so a log uniform prior. So what we would do then is uh, bxa.create log uniform. Uh, prior for oops. and then the uh, second parameter. So that's going to be first the model, then the parameter. Yeah, it keeps disappearing. I don't know why. Okay. Mm. Yeah, that's funny. I see the focus disappear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know why. Um, okay. So yeah, and then if you've done it correctly, then uh, BXA will print out um, the the prize that have been created from that. Uh, okay. So that's yeah, that's the prize. Then the next step is you have to create what's called a, a solver, and so a BXA solver. Okay. So uh, basically, this holds information about the, the fit that can then be used afterwards. Um, and it uh, sort of defines the, the uh, input parameters input parameters for your, for your fit. So if we were to just do solver equals uh, bxa dot bxa, oops, so I think it's like that. Yep, so capital BXAS and then solver. Um, and then all we're going to do is just say transformations equals transformations. Um, and then also important that we set uh, an output files base name. So this basically, BXA is going to create a folder with all the fit information, all the, the, the plots, the, the points that are generated, the chain file, and things like that. Um, and it's all going to put it in a folder that's called this name. Okay. So here we're just going to say uh, my mod my expec uh, try not to make it too long um, uh, just in case um, the the maximum length is uh, exceeded um, but that should hopefully create the solver and then after you've created that all you have to do well, actually before we actually run the fit uh, the next thing we're going to do. Um, is we're going to check that they make sense. Okay, so uh, I had a bit of trouble um, getting uh, the solver dot set parameters to to work. I think when I was trying, yeah. So instead, what you can do is on the uh, the web page, I've created a link to the set parameters part. So on the so on exercise 1.1, where it says perform prior predictive checks. Um, if you go to number two, where the text is blue, if you click on that, it will take you to the equivalent code. If you just copy that into your script, I have it here for me, and it should look something like this. In the meantime, I'll just uh, copy that in that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, just for 10 
uh, random samples of the prior function. We're going to uh, plot what the what the spectrum looks like for that equivalent prior points. Okay, so if we just do find range and this is probably quite a primitive way of doing it. Um, but what you can do is you can do values equals solver dot prior function. Uh, and then, oh, by the way, we would have to also, uh, I should probably do that for me as well, have to import numpy. So, So yeah, we're just going to sample two random points from the uh, from the the photon index and the normalization separately. Um, so inside here, we're going to do size equals the len solver dot param names because there's two parameters. Um, that should like that. And then we're going to set the parameters of the model to transformation flips. We're gonna basically set the parameters to those values that we've just sampled. Um, and then for PyXPEC, we want to just plot the log data. So you can do LD or log data. Um, and then because we're doing this in a loop and we just want to manually check just to see if everything's reasonable, uh, quite primitive, but you can just do pause input like that. Um, and then essentially, again, you won't be able to see, uh, but it's brought up a window with the spectrum. Um, and so each time you go through, it will show a spectrum that's sort of above and below the points if you go through enough of them. Okay. And all you want to see is basically that wherever the spectrum lies, if it's above and below or in, in roughly in between the data points, um, then it's a, it's a good prior to, to use, which we know for this case, it, um, because we can pretty much guess what the normalization is gonna be. But for more complex models, um, that's why this can be useful. Okay, so we've done the prior predictive checks. Uh, are there any questions on that uh, specifically? Thank you, uh, Johannes, for putting, yeah, so if you want to use set parameters, you can use the code that uh, Johannes has put in the chat to, to do that instead of copying it from the from the, the source code. What, what is being displayed in your plot window? Anything? Uh, so yeah, it's basically showing the, uh, the spectrum and then the, uh, so the, the data, sorry, and then the model spectrum. Uh, would it help if I maybe share yeah. the plot window? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me just uh, stop sharing. So I'm curious if this is actually going to update itself when I do this. We'll find out. Yeah, I see it updating. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So as you go through the loop, you can see that the prior goes above and below the points, right? Like you would want. For a, mm -hmm. for a reasonable prior. Um, uh, a bad prior would basically be in this particular case, if it was, if all of the spectra were above say 10, right? Then you'd know that you something's gone wrong or the, the wrong range has been chosen. So that, that, that loop is just showing you where your priors are or the bounds of the prior are. And then, and that's for, that's the checking the priors part. And then yeah. the next, the next part would be the actual Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So this, yeah, this is just showing that the, um, this is a, effectively, I guess the equivalent would be in, uh, if you're doing a local fit to, to plot your spectrum beforehand, just to see if you are close to the, the data points, just so that it doesn't get lost in the local minimum when you click fit. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so in this case, yeah, you're just checking that the range you've chosen is, um, above and below, uh, the, the actual data. And in this case, it's the overall data because that that emission line, that iron emission line, is way above that 
that prior limit, but that's fine. Yeah, no, yeah, that's that's a very good point. And uh, so that's that's why a little bit later, the the iron emission line, um, uh, it basically shows that you have to change the model, right? Instead of changing the priors. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so that's a very good point, yeah. Okay, so if I stop sharing. Um, so now that we've, yeah, we've checked that the priors are right. Um, so next is so exercise 1.2. Um, and uh, yeah, so in normal PyXPEC or normal Sherpa, we would just do fit, right? Or fit.perform in PyXPEC. But here, all we have to do is just say uh, results equals solver.run uh resume equals true now by i should warn you that by doing resume equals true um you're basically saying that uh if there's already a partly started job or a completely finished job with the same output files base name um bxa will try to open that one and uh sort of um sort of uh restart the likelihood that it's got on, on that fit, okay? So if the models change slightly, or if it's just completely the different model, um, but you just kept accidentally the, the output files base name, just be warned that will be why you, you get an error message. Okay. Um, okay, so after we run that, you should get a printout that looks kind of like this. And what this is showing on each iteration, it's showing the range that uh, BXA is finding in the different parameters to be the, the correct one, okay? Um, so you'll notice as well that by setting a log uniform prior on the normalization, um, BXA has effectively created this slightly new parameter, which is log norm um, and varied it in log space. In Sherpa, you would have to create the log normalization yourself um, as a new parameter and then input that into BXA. And the instructions to do that are on the, the web page. Okay. So yeah, it tells you uh, when it's effectively approaching 100% for finished here. And this is the, the, uh, the evidence. Um, and then when it's done, it will print out the, uh, the log Z. So this is the Bayesian evidence. Um, and it will print out the, the best fit parameter values. Uh, so for anyone that's interested in pandas or anything like that, I find it quite useful um, if you were to want to use the chain values, for instance, if for the error propagation exercise in exercise 1.4, um, or if you wanted to produce your own plots of contour plots or, um, or to uh, work out your own quantiles, medians of the, the parameters or maximum posteriors of the uh, the parameter values, then what you would have to do uh, here is just to say, um, just to set up an empty data frame, fill it with, so the data is going to be the results and the samples key. Um, and then the columns of your data frame are just going to be the pram names that we used from earlier. Right? So the solver dot pram names. Okay, and now what that does is you can do data frame dot head, and as you can see, it's basically got the the flow index and the the log normalization values as a data frame that you can then use. Okay. Okay, so uh, in terms of what is the time? So yeah, we are slightly running out of time. Um, oh. Yes. Okay. So Johannes is probably the best person to ask about the uh, ins and outs of the the different quantities here. Um, but very briefly, uh, from what I know, so the uh, the likelihood range being considered on each iteration is shown in this part. Um, I think, um, and then the. Uh, the number of iterations over the number of, value, of evaluations uh, is shown here. And then the efficiency is effectively showing how many points are uh, have remained from the original starting point. Okay, so um, nested sampling basically, well, briefly works from um, throwing out points that have the, 
the worst likelihood and then refilling in the region in your parameter space that have better ones. Um, and so if you have a very, very big parameter space, then as it removes points, you're going to lose points. Um, and so this basically shows you how many of the points have been removed. Okay. Um, um, so in terms of the model comparison, uh, right, because uh, we're slightly running out of time, um, there are a few interesting things that you can do. I'll just try and get up here. Uh, so the first one is the AIC, so the uh, KT information criterion, um, which I have somewhere. Um, so yeah, there are two basically uh, model comparison techniques that I was going to cover in, in this session. So the first one is the AIC, which is basically a method that penalizes extra model complexity when it's not warranted from a particular uh, data set. Right. Um, and then there's the Bayesian evidence, which is uh, kind of, a, um, oh, well, it's the, the marginal likelihood, right? So it's the, uh, it's an equivalent of likelihood ratios, but where you factor in the, the priors that you've used as well. Okay. Um, so if I just, uh, yes, so I've, I've run the model fits for a power law model, a power law plus uh, Gaussian, oh no, an absorbed power law, and then an absorbed power law plus Gaussian. Okay, so three different models. Okay, and I'm hoping this will work if I type these in. But basically, all this does here, uh, so we're using the JSON uh, uh, model here to load the results which are stored in your output files base name slash results slash, no, slash info slash results dot JSON. Okay, um, and uh, that will show you the, the log likelihood and the degrees of freedom. And then the AIC is just the uh, two times the degrees of freedom minus two times the, the, like, the, the log likelihood. Okay, so after uh, doing that, if you then type AIC, this basically shows you that the uh, smallest AIC is for um, the line of sight model, uh, absorption model with a uh, Gaussian line, which uh, um, as we said earlier, the, the line is very present, right? Um, so yeah, that's basically showing that the most favored model with the AIC, because it's the lowest, significantly lowest as well, um, much more than, uh, the difference is much more than two, uh, is this model here, okay? So another uh, way, to check if a model um, is preferred uh, is to use model comparison. And one thing, uh, one nifty thing on the BXA website is the model compare um, scripts, which I've linked to in the, the exercises. Um, so exit there. Um, and I'm hoping this will work. Uh, so if you type Python 3, then the name of the script, which um, you copy to the directory that you're in, and then the three um, output, output file base names that you've chosen for your three models, okay? And then I'm hoping that will work. Yes, okay. And what it does is for every single model, it orders them by the difference in their log uh, Asian evidence, okay? And um, although the exact threshold for all of these model comparison techniques really strictly speaking should be done, uh, should be determined with, with uh, simulations, um, a one you know, uh, general rule of thumb that you can use is uh, the Jeffrey scale, which effectively says that more than a value of 100 is very, very uh, likely that a model is favored okay, for good data quality. Um, and so in log space, that would be a factor of two. And because the difference between the line of sight absorption model and the line of sight with an emission line model is 13.1, so much higher than two, here it tells you that the, the fit is good. Um, so yeah, that's a way of uh, selecting a favored model. Um, so in terms of this, this idea of the, the exact threshold for AIC and also log Z um, to figure out which model is preferred, uh, 
yeah, the exact threshold, um, you should really, or well, it's good practice to, to calculate that with some simulations. And I will be covering that briefly in my talk tomorrow and also for the, the exercises, I think it's exercise 2.2, um, which is yet to be up on the website, but it will be. Um, so I know I did go through that quite quickly. Sorry about that. Uh, but if there are any questions on any of that, I'd be uh, very happy to take any that you might have. I think I want to see the fit, if you, if you don't mind resharing your, your oh, fit. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, this will be the, so the fit for the first model, so just a power law. Oh, I've just loaded the Sherpa one, which is always good. So if we do, yep. okay. Right. And then, because we're doing resume equals true, it will be a very quick process because it, the points are already there, so it just goes through them. Um, and then I can't remember if in the expect version it automatically sets it to the best fit. Yes, it does. Okay. And that's the best that you get. So this would be a case where when you do a model comparison, you'd, you'd show that another model was would be improved because you'd fit more of the features. Yes, yeah, indeed. Um, there is also some ways to, to do model verification as well. So instead of um, trying to, to find a better and better model, um, you can also check if the model that you have currently is, the, is a good fit. Um, and that was also something I was going to go over tomorrow, but briefly, it's basically what we did with the priors, but we're sampling instead of from the prior distribution, we're going to be sampling from the posteriors and comparing the W statistic from uh, simulated data um, to the, the actual data itself. Um, so they're posterior predictive checks, and they effectively show if the, the fit on average for the data quality that you have is uh, a reasonable fit. So yeah, this basically shows that there's a nice sort of dependency um, between the parameters between photon index and normalization, um, which kind of makes sense, right? Because if you change the steepness, then the normalization will also have to change correspondingly. So you can't know both perfectly simultaneously is what that's showing. Mm -hmm. um, but what's powerful about this is if you have a, you know, a slightly more complex model uh, where parameters might be degenerate with one another um, in particular ways, or if there are multiple modes, um, then this method should be able to show those. Um, and then that's why with the, in the error propagation exercise, so I think it's 1.4 maybe. Right. Um, uh, if, you, if you use the actual chain values from this, then the, all of those degeneracies and multiple modes, they're all conserved. So when you, create uh, um, uncertainties on parameters that you've derived from the other parameters, right? So in that particular example, it's the equivalent width, um, then those, those uncertainties are preserved or the, the structure of those uncertainties are preserved, which is quite powerful. And those files are in the directory that it put all of the, uh, the best fit in all the files that when you set the output directory, they're all located in there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Three plots that are automatically put in there. In the expect module, there's also additional code, which I've included on the, the exercises, uh, where you can um, uh, plot the um, posterior convolved and unconvolved models as well, just to see the range in your models. And then you can also do that for the model components um, by freezing different components to zero. Um, and then you can basically plot out your individual components. Uh, so one of the main ones is the, the trace plot. So that basically shows the progress of the fit uh, over the duration. So the minus log x on the x-axis on in the trace.pdf um, basically shows yeah um, where you started from um, to where to where it finished. Uh, and then the the final one-dimensional um, 
uh, austereo distribution. Uh, and then the run again, it shows the the progress, but the progress in the so the the evidence, um, yeah, and the in the different uh, values, and it basically shows that as the uh, the duration goes on, eventually the um, the normalized likelihood that's being numerically solved by BXA by the nested sampling is approaching one. Um, so that's the second panel from the top. Um, so it's just yeah, they're just different ways of showing the the progress of the fit, just to check that everything um, went uh, went all right during the fit. Peter, what is it? Could you ls the directory that it created and just show us the the list oh, of sorry, files? Sorry, getting the sorry, you can't see. Uh, so it's gonna be. So, oh, so that's can, okay. Quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, if anyone's ever used MCMC chains in XBEC, um, BXA outputs an equivalent file called chain.fits. So, you would just do chain load file name in XBEC, for instance. Um, then, yeah, the, the chains, the debug.log base, basically tells you how the fit uh, went on. Uh, it's quite useful for seeing uh, how long it took, for instance, um, if you should change any input parameters to make it run a bit faster, anything like that. Uh, the, ooh, let me see, let me just drop my memory. Yeah, so extra uh, probably won't have anything in it unless you do extra stuff on it. Um, info, uh, so that's going to contain your results.json, and then also some your posterior summary that's output in a CSE, CSV file. Um, the plots, again, so the corner, the, the, the run plot, and also the trace plot that we just showed, that we just went through. And then results is going to contain the points, which I believe is what's read in when you do solver.run resume equals true. That's the file that it uses to, to restart the, the run. Okay, yeah, so this is uh, just a quick talk for the, the second session, just to put everyone on sort of a level footing, hopefully. Um, oh, that's the wrong keyboard again. Okay. Yep, so uh, for this session, um, what I was broadly going to go over was uh, the main thing is posterior combination. So this idea that if you have a sample of sources and then you fit uh, each source with a particular model and derive a posterior on some parameter, um, the basically methods or um, optimum methods to combine those individual posteriors into a sample or a, a parent population distribution. Okay. Um, then we are going to talk a little bit about uh, model selection um, and the model selection thresholds. So yesterday I mentioned that um, in terms of base factors, um, it's generally, you know, generally sometimes you can you can assume that uh, a value of a base factor more than say 100 is very, very strong to favor one model over another, but the exact number itself does depend quite significantly on various different things, such as the data quality that you're actually, fit, actually fitting, right? And it kind of makes sense if, if the data isn't very good, then your, your model selection thresholds or your, sorry, your model selection techniques um, should not really make a decision on a model, um, or it makes more sense to not make a decision on a model if the data quality isn't good enough to warrant it. Right? So there are some methods where you can calibrate those thresholds, and for particular observations that you might have, you can run a whole bunch of simulations and different methods to try and detect or try and figure out what the, the false positive rate is, so um, how many times a particular uh, threshold will select the correct model over the, the wrong one. Um, so then uh, the third thing was more about uh, model verification. So um, it's all and good having uh, nice ways to select models, um, but if you select one model as being the best out of a, a group of models, how can you then uh, say that that model you've selected is actually a good fit? And so it's a bit more about goodness of fit. And there is uh, one method um, that you can do, again, with simulations, but uh, called posterior predictive checks. Now, I was going to, I was considering talking a bit more about binning and background modeling. Um, we probably won't have time, just because there's uh, a whole bunch of other stuff I was hoping to go through. 
um, in terms of the exercises. Uh, but the I have written quite a bit on the exercises, and then there's also a very very cool. Uh, um, I think it's a GitHub page, but written by uh, Giacomo, Giacomo uh, Vianello, who um, basically talks through the the issues with CSTAT and also the benefits of it and uh, how to um, correctly bin your data to, to fit particular models. And then in terms of the auto background exercise 1.7 runs through how to simultaneously fit a background spectrum and a source spectrum um uh in sherpa using bxa okay so just to go back to the same example that i mentioned yesterday just because it's the one i'm most familiar with so sorry if people don't like it um but uh so in terms of agm obscuration the the problem that i, that I mentioned is that the idea is that you have this x-ray source very close to a to the supermassive black hole emitting um some sort of power law emission um, or some sort of mission that can be approximated with a power law. It's passing through some obscuration. And then as it does that, um, the, the X-ray photons are scattered and absorbed. Um, and depending on how much scattering and absorption you get in, or that you can detect in your spectrum, which I'm showing here on the left with this inset, you can predict what the line of sight column density is, okay? Now, of course, there's there's lots of uh, degeneracies, degeneracies here to do with the, um, the geometries that we're playing with, because for different uh, X-ray models, you can assume uh, a lot of different complex geometries, and there are a lot available publicly at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, there's the number of geometric degrees of freedom um, is is very high, right? So that's why you would want to use things like uh, BXA and more sophisticated fitting methods, just to be able to explore the local minima. So this is uh, effectively the solution, but also the problem, right? So for all of those geometries, um, and then for also some other different forms of models that are assuming different things, uh, you basically have a different model. Okay, so uh, here I'm showing uh, a large number of models for a particular project that I, I was working on, where for uh, a group of sources, I fit um, this number of models to every source. Okay, now uh, the, the issue associated with this is that once you fit all of these models, which in their own way has some sort of uh, line of sight column density, the issue is that if you were to assume just one model, then you would have that number of column density distributions, right? Which is of course not useful. Okay, um, and as you can see for the models up here, it um, the column density distribution you get basically finds that you have uh, the majority of them are unobscured, right? With column densities around ten to the twenty, whereas uh, more physically motivated models seem to find slightly higher um, fractions of heavily obscured sources. Okay. Um, so the the thing you really want to be able to do is to be able to select the the correct model, as we've been saying with model selection, um, and and yeah, once once you have done that, um, once you have a model per source, then it's also a, a matter of uh, combining the individual posteriors. Okay. So in terms of posterior combination, uh, one very nice way of doing it is with Bayesian hierarchical modeling where you simultaneously fit for the parameters of the individual distributions um, simultaneously to the, the uh, parameters of the global population distribution. Um, and here on the right, I'm showing one way one can do this, which is supported by posterior stacker, which are, is a slightly different method of doing this sort of fitting, which I'll get onto in a sec. But the idea is that for every bin in your histogram, um, or in your distribution that you're trying to fit in your parent population, um, every single bin is a free parameter, okay? And uh, the, the free parameters of that population um, is then informed from the individual line of sight posteriors from a single or from the individual observed X-ray spectra. Now, uh, what posterior stacker does is it essentially uh, takes the the integral involved with this problem um, and simplifies it numerically. Okay, meaning that it's uh, a lot quicker to be able to uh, 
um, calculate the estimated population distribution from an arbitrary number of uh, individual posteriors that you feed into it. Okay. And this is uh, covered very nicely in Baron Celi et al. Uh, 2020. So I do recommend anyone uh, interested in more of the finer details really um, taking a look at that. And so for anyone interested, that's what you uh, end up with here when you um, select models in different ways. So I'm showing here on the left, this is when you select models based on the base factors versus when you select models with AIC. And the answer, um, thankfully, is that they are consistent with an errors, right, with these models. Um, now, this, uh, this is um, a function of your data quality, as we've been saying, but it is also a function of the limitations of your models, OK? So that's why, for instance, this, this big drop here, this isn't a, a physical thing. This isn't something that uh, um, the individual source column densities are actually doing. It's just because the models or the vast majority of the models that were selected by these methods uh, tend to uh, disfavor or sometimes don't even go above 10 to the 25. Okay, So it's always important to, to know the limitations of your models for your individual posteriors and the assumptions that went into them um, before getting any uh, conclusions out of the, the parent population as well. Okay, so now that we've spoken a bit about that, and hopefully there'll be time for me to go through the, the first exercise of session two, which is on the, uh, on the website. Um, but talking a little bit more about uh, base factors or model selection in general, um, and again, this is uh, a figure taken from Baron et al. in 2020, essentially showing the, uh, the difference in um, Bayesian, so the, the, effectively the base factor as a function of signal to noise, right? So if you, can you see my cursor? Yeah. Um, so if you see the x-axis is actually decreasing in signal to noise and the difference uh, in Bayesian evidence, right, so the base factor between two particular models, right, um, the difference is much greater until you reach a signal to noise of around seven um, for this particular work where the, uh, the difference levels off. Now I should say that this, this particular figure from the paper is actually based on a whole bunch of simulations that they did, but the actual observations they found similar results um, to the shape of this, this plot um, as well. Uh, Okay, so this is where this idea of simulation-based calibration comes in for um, uh, model selection thresholds. Okay, so the idea is that you uh, simulate many models um, for a particular brightness. So here I'm showing uh, a very nice, uh, or a plot from a very nice um, set of simulations from Johannes's 2014 paper, where the, uh, you assume different levels of brightness of a particular source um, and you simulate a bunch of models and then fit with various different models and uh, check how many times for a given, um, uh, a given, in this case, beige factor threshold, um, the correct model is selected or the wrong model is selected. And these plots basically show that as you get to uh, a value of as low as actually 10 in contrast to the value of 100 I was saying earlier, for these particular simulations, um, the correct model was tending to be uh, selected. So this is actually, I think, exercise 2.2. Um, now, the reason we probably won't do this in the session today is um, it does involve simulating maybe 100 or so spectra and then doing, for, for our example, at least three fits per spectrum. So it'll be around 300 BXA fits, which would be probably a, a bit too long to do in an hour session. Um, but yeah, I do recommend anyone interested in this to, to really give it a go, because uh, yeah. Okay, so as, as, uh, as I was saying earlier, right, so okay, you can have a whole bunch of models, um, and this is a plot that I, I made for a particular um, source that I was fitting with Newstar data. So for those who don't know, there's two cameras on Newstar, so FPMB, oh sorry, FPMA and FPMB. Um, and then I was simultaneously fitting 
the, the new star spectra with a soft excess, a soft, <laughs> a soft X-ray spectrum from Suzaku, so XIS3. Okay. And so here I've split them into their individuals and then also added up the individual uh, the individual values as well. Now, the, the, the only values that change in the individual pa um, panels is the x-axis because the Bayesian evidence is the same for the, the global fit. Um, and as you can see, you can uh, say that there's a given threshold, which is the, the best model minus, in this case, I think it was a factor of 100. Um, so in these units, it's going to be log z over z p1, uh, difference of two, right? So log of 100, um, which is the, the width of these lines, okay? And all of the colored in stars are the models that are sort of selected as being, you know, within that, that threshold, okay? Um, but this is all well and good, right? You can select a number of models, um, quite a few models in this case that are actually uh, consistent with being the best model, right? Or the most favored model even. Um, but how do you actually check that that model fit is in fact good, right? So this is where model verification comes in. So we spoke very briefly about QQ plots uh, yesterday, but uh, just to go over them in a bit more detail, they're essentially an alternative to residual plots, um, where instead of showing the binned residuals, you uh, plot the cumulative di distribution of the observed counts on the x-axis, and then the uh, cumulative distribution of the, the model counts on the y-axis, okay? And now uh, the benefits of that is that you don't have to bin anything. So it's, uh, it's completely unbinned. So you can really pick out the finer um, points where your, your model might be missing something. Um, and uh, marked on for this particular plot from uh, Yanez's 2014 paper again, um, is the different uh, energy bands where particular effects start to come in for the different models that are shown with the three colored lines. Um, so for instance, where there's a data excess, the line deviates into this direction, right? So here, there, there may be a, a line that's not being fit, for instance. Um, and then also at around AKV or beyond, there may be a line that's not being fit uh, um, so well, say in the pink model versus the yellow one, for instance. Um, then, just to briefly flag it up again, this I think I showed this plot yesterday, but there's another way of doing it where you essentially show the uh, y-axis minus the x-axis, right? Um, which is what I'm showing in these panels down here. Um, and it's basically the same plot. The only reason I've got a shaded region is just because I've plotted the, the posterior 68% uh, range in the, the values as a shaded region, just showing that with this model, it is actually broadly consistent with just being a horizontal line, so being a good fit, okay? So that's sort of a qualitative way of saying that it's a, that it's a reasonable fit, but what if you want to make something a bit more quantitative, then this is where posterior predictive checks comes in, okay? So the idea is that you fit your model with BXA, then you sample uh, like a few posterior rows, or if you want to um, keep the runtime down a bit, you can sample just the best posterior row, um, so the, the, the best likelihood row. Then for that particular row, you're gonna have this whole bunch of parameters for your model, so you load those model parameters. And then from that, that, uh, that, that fit, um, that you've now loaded into XPEC or Sherpa, um, you would simulate a whole bunch of spectra. And then on every time you simulate, you would remember or note down the, the W statistic or the C statistic, depending on what statistic you're using. Um, and then after the simulations, you would then compare that to the original statistic of your original real sampled posterior row. And you end up with diagrams like this, right? So for what I was showing earlier, where I had that, New star plus Suzaku fit. Um, the blue distribution in the background is the simulated one. And if the model that I'm using is able to explain all the individual nuances in the data and all the individual um, dips and things in the data, then they should agree very nicely, which they do here, right? For XIS3 and FPMA. The difference in FPMB uh, is being caused by just being a uh, um, a lower signal to noise for the FPMB spectrum than FPMA. Um, but yeah, overall, if you add them all together, you end up with 
an acceptable fit, right? Because it's it's reasonably uh, inside the the simulated distribution range. Okay, so that was uh, probably quite uh, quick for these these extra concepts. Um, but just briefly, so we've covered Bayesian hierarchical modeling, basically this idea of combining individual posteriors into a sample distribution. Um, then there's also ways to, to work out the correct sort of model thresholds or model comparison thresholds that, to use for any particular data set quality um, that you might be using. And then there's also uh, posterior predictive checks to get more of a quantitative um, measure of the goodness of fit for a particular fit that you get with BXA. Uh, yeah, Johannes? Yeah, um, just wanted to say a couple more words, if I may. Um, can you go back a couple of slides? Yeah. To, um, where you talked about the sample distributions, about the, the hierarchical model. Yeah. This one? Yeah, so this you can you, even if you just have one model that you fit and one particular parameter that you're interested in you can apply this to get a distribution of um, how this parameter is distributed in your sample uh, here we're not doing any correction for selection bias so it's really just the distribution of the sample not of the unbiased uh, underlying population unless you have a complete and unbiased sample, of course, then it would be the same. Um, here is shown this kind of binned uh, model that um, Peter was, was demonstrating, but you can also use a Gaussian uh, sample distribution, and then you estimate the mean of that distribution and the width of that distribution over that parameter of interest. And then I wanted to say something about the um, model fit that you showed you you showed some spectra and the posteriors on those this one or... yeah here so um the you have very nice data actually so your uncertainties on your posterior um on the model are actually very small but you could imagine different situations where they would be much larger and one way of doing posterior predictive checks is um, to generate counts from each uh, instance of your model. And then you would have counts at each energy uh, channel, right? And then you could look, do your actual counts that you observed lie within that distribution of counts? And that's, that's one common way to do posterior predictive checks. What Peter later showed is to, you, to look at a derived quantity, the W stat, which sort of squashes all of that information together, sort of a summary statistic, and look how that is distributed. So, uh, so yeah, if you scroll down on the exercises, um, so yeah, just a brief introduction. So for session two in general, I've tried to include um, two code snippets that basically um, you can use to sort of as a basis to just simulate um, a model from Sherpa or PyXPEC. Uh, please do let me know if there are any typos or if it just doesn't work. <laughs> but I, it worked on my machine, so hopefully it'll, it'll be okay. Um, but yeah, they will probably be more useful for questions or exercise 2.2 and 2.3. Um, but for the uh, Bayesian hierarchical modeling, uh, so for actually I'll make that a little bit bigger if that helps. Um, right. So I, in the interest of time, uh, yesterday I generated a whole bunch of photon index values from I think a Gaussian distribution. Yeah, a Gaussian distribution of 1.8 plus or minus 0.5. Um, just a war warning. Uh, I did realize after I did that 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 was very wide considering I've only actually done 30 sources. Um, so yeah, just, just do bear, bear that in mind. Um, but you can download a, a, a zip folder from the, the link here, um, which will basically have all 30 uh, Ultranest or BXA folders, the output folders that you get from the fits. 
uh, which is what we will use for uh, this exercise. So if I change. First, just make sure I'm in the right environment. Then I'm just going to change to the uh, right directory. Okay, so yeah, I have all of these uh, folders um, in here. Probably a bit easier if I just do. Yeah, so this this uh, directory here. So the ones that say fits in, these are what you will download um, when you when you click on the link, uh, and they basically just contain everything from a PyExpec output. Okay, so for this exercise, you won't need PyExpec or Sherpa. Uh, I see Trum. Um, so yeah, don't worry about that. Uh, but the, the first thing you'll just need to do is do a pip install posterior stacker. Um, if you don't want to do that, you can also just download the scripts themselves from the, the GitHub page. Um, now, the, yeah, the first thing we want to do for a uh, posterior stacker. So as I mentioned, it's it's kind of a numerical approximation of this, this integral, or this, I think it's a double integral involved with um, uh, Bayesian hierarchical modeling, right? Um, so uh, as this numerical approximation, what it does is it takes a certain sample of the posterior rows from a given, from each fit, okay? And so there's a very nice uh, script uh, included, which is the uh, load ultra nest outputs uh, script. Um, and you have to give it the name of all of the uh, all of the output directories and then specify how many samples, how many rows you want to you want to take from from each one um, and the parameter that you want to take from from that uh, distribution uh, from the posterior. And then it'll output it into a particular file. OK, so if we uh, just let me check that I've actually got the right environment, which would help. Oops. No, I have not. Okay, so, uh, yep. So what we're gonna do is that. So you're going to type load ultra nest outputs.py. Um, if you're if you haven't installed it with pip, you just do python3 um, load ultra nest outputs.py. Uh, and then immediately afterwards, just list with a separated by a space all of the directories. Okay. Then the, the next um, argument is going to be uh, samples, so the number of samples. And here we're going to sample a thousand from each one. Okay. So a thousand rows of every posterior for each, each source. Then uh, we're going to tell it which parameter we want to take out of the posterior. Okay, so we're interested in the photon index, and for these particular runs, I called the parameter pho index because we were using PyExpec, which uh, uses a case-sensitive version of the parameters. And then the last thing we're going to say uh, as out, we're going to do the. Uh, we're just going to call it posterior samples. I'm going to call it two .txt, but you won't have to. It's just because. I've already got one I was testing earlier, which uh, I will keep just in case this does go wrong. <laughs> okay. So then it'll tell you the, the columns of the posterior. Um, and if you were to list, yeah, the, you should then have posterior samples to um, .txt or whatever you've called it um, in, in your directory. Do you okay. want to show us what's in there? Uh, yes, I was. Uh, so I was going to go. So on this part, this is where I load it into pandas. Um, but basically, if you. Uh, so if you uh, import numpy, this file can then be loaded.
um, and this is essentially what it is. So it's got uh, 30 um, uh, arrays of length, a thousand inside an array, so it's a two-dimensional array. So if you do, so yeah, it's just got for all 30 folders, the thousand uh, posterior rows that's been sampled. Um, so then on the web page, uh, so you can follow this, this code just to print out basically an approximation of all the data points, um, which will end up looking like this. So what this is, is on the y-axis is just uh, an arbitrary number for the number of uh, the data point number. Okay. Um, and on the x-axis is the photon index value um, indicated by the 50th percentile. And then the, the lower point of the error bar is the 16th percent percentile. Um, and then the, the 84th percentile, okay, um, is the upper one. Uh, this is just um, uh, a way to sort of visualize the data. This doesn't show the shape of the posterior. It's just sort of an approximation. Um, and as you can see, actually not uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, asymmetry with this statistic or with this um, method of using quantiles, uh, but that yeah that doesn't actually say anything about the posterior. But uh, this is yeah this is just for a visual aid. The actual posteriors themselves are still stored in posterior samples.txt, um, which is what's then going to be fed into posterior stacker. Okay. In terms of uh, the next bit is just to then run posterior stacker, which is then going to combine uh, these into this parent population, uh, approximating as, as Johannes said with the Gaussian model as well as the, the histogram model. Okay. Um, so earlier when I mentioned the issue associated with simulating from such a broad distribution but only having 30 sources, is you can kind of see it here. So the distribution I simulated the photon index from was 1.8 plus or minus 0.5, which as you can see, uh, in terms of the data points, it's pretty much, it's pretty much there. But in terms of the, the points that are going to carry the most statistical weight, so the ones with the, the smallest errors, um, sorry, uh, the, so the ones with the smallest errors, these are going to be the ones that drag the uh, distribution towards the left here. So, uh, Spoiler alert, it will probably come out with a number that's slightly less than 1.8 plus or minus 0.5, but it will be consistent with that number. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Anetta, did you put your hand up? Or... Yes, I have a question about this uh, errors or posterior. So in your plot, in your figure, it looks like all the uh, uncertainties are symmetric. So mm. do you require the symmetric uh, errors? No, not, not at all, no, no. So this, uh, it just, it kind of turned out like that. I think that's because I was, these, the simulated models are just basically an absorbed power law. So it's quite a simple model. Um, and so the the actual distributions of parameters um, that I was probably getting out were probably fairly symmetric, but there's no reason to, to okay. have such a symmetric, yeah, such a symmetric fit. Are there any other uh, questions? I think, oh yeah, it was answered in the chat, I think. Okay. So then the last thing is to uh, run posterior stacker. So do is we write posterior stacker.py, uh, then give it the name of the text file, or the, uh, sorry, the, the output from the, the previous uh, commands. Then what we're going to do is we're going to give the lower limit of the uh, the model that we're going to use. So for the histogram model or the, the Gaussian model. So I from the, the the plot that we made up here, it kind of makes sense to make it between 0.5 and 3, right? Um, so we'll put 0 0.5, then the upper limit, so we put zero. Um, and then the number of bins in the histogram model. Okay, so we can put 10, for instance, here. And then the name that we'd want on the uh, x-axis of the plots that Posterior Stacker um, produces. So if we just say oh, index. Okay, hopefully that should all. Um, 
you wanted to run in the shell. Oh, sorry, of course I did. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I don't believe that one should work. Oh, yes, but because I'm using the uh, wrong uh, condor environment, this won't work. So what I can do is that I have it in here, yep. So I'll just activate the other one. Sorry about this. Hopefully that will work. Yeah, and it'll come up with the ultranest uh, fit first for the, I think first is the histogram model. Um, I think so. Um, but yeah, it will uh, fit both the, the histogram model and also the uh, the Gaussian model. So as you can see, the progress is now done. Yeah, so it will tell you for the histogram model, each of the 10 bins that we asked for it to produce, the, the relative fraction for each. Okay, so it's finding somewhere in the middle of the range, which concerning considering we did 0.5 to 3 and we wanted 1.8, that's looking pretty good. Okay. Um, then it'll fit the, yeah, so the Gaussian model, which is usually quicker. Uh, and as I said, yeah, so the, the value it finds is 1.6 plus or minus 0.3. So consistent with this value of 0.8, uh, 1.8, um, but the reason it's not 1.8 is because I uh, didn't simulate enough data sets. It would have been a very big file to download, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. But consistent with it. Um, then probably good to show the outputs that we get. This one. So this uh, shows the the two distributions plotted. Um, so the histogram model in black basically shows it's pretty good for this this value of one point eight. It's pretty consistent with that. And then also the Gaussian model that you get. Um, with the equivalent one. But you could imagine a situation where your, your distribution is not uh, shaped like a Gaussian, so where the, the histogram model would really be a very, very powerful way of doing it. Um, okay. Are there any other questions on that? I think it is uh, time, but uh, are there other uh, is there still a little bit of time for questions on any? Yeah, we can take we can go into the break a little bit and just maybe leave at least five minute break at the end. So cool. 10 minutes. Yeah, if people have questions. Right. I have a question. How many would you have run? Uh, or is there a rule of thumb for how many you should run? Uh, so how many sources? Right. Uh, so I mean, yeah, I think it's a rule of thumb, but at the same time, the the actual value that you do get out is is pretty pretty close, right? Um, but uh, yeah, maybe I think the issue was that I was trying to simulate so variable photon index, but then I also tried to make the signal to noise variable, and then doing that, I ended up with a handful of points that were just extremely well fit because they were so bright. Um, which wouldn't, I don't think that's a particularly realistic case. Uh, so yeah, it probably make it better if I simulated with slightly just uh, fainter across the board or just a certain, a certain exposure, for instance, in the simulations. So uh, about the approximations for speed that posterior stacker uh, does. Um, Johannes, could you, could you answer this just for the, yeah, for the approximations? Yeah, so um, it's using a hierarchical Bayesian model internally, but if, as, as Peter said, if you would do this all in one go, you would have to do the spectral fitting uh, simultaneously with the population or the, the sample distribution fitting. And so instead it uses the posterior samples, but the important caveat here is and that you should very emphasize a lot. You have to analyze with a flat prior on that parameter. 
that's really important because you are you are trying to find the distribution across that parameter. And then what you have are posterior samples um, that describe your uncertainty that can be upper limits, lower limits, or asymmetric, or as here, symmetric, doesn't matter. Um, and basically what it's doing then is using those, in this case, 1000 posterior samples to do a numeric integral. So it basically takes these 1000 points and evaluates the sample distribution over those and integrates that. And so if those 1000 points are a reasonable approximation to this numeric integral, everything's fine. But if your posterior is very wide and all of them are very uncertain, then um, these, these number of samples might not uh, sample well where your sample distribution will be. And then you will run into numerical issues. So it's, it's definitely a good idea to vary this. So to try, I don't know, you, you experiment first with a couple hundred, and then when you are happy with what you think is the right answer, you just crank it up by a factor of 10 and make sure that it's, it gives you the same result that it's numerically stable. Thanks. Uh, Douglas, does that answer your question? Yeah, um, I think the only other thing I'd wonder about is, is it, for example, if the um, population parameter you're trying to estimate is, say, horribly de degenerate with something else. Would that be a problem in that you're doing the two levels separately or not? So from what I remember, I think posterior stacker uh, can't uh, figure out the, the degenerate problem. But I think if you were to solve this problem with Stan with a, um, uh, with the, uh, so I think, yeah, in that Baroncelli paper that I mentioned, they, they did this approximation with uh, the posterior stacker method. And then also in Stan, where you're um, essentially analytically solving the shape of every posterior with a, a beta function, which is quite a flexible function, um, and simultaneously doing that and solving for the, post, uh, the parent population um, to try and get around this, this, this problem that Johannes mentioned of, um, having to fit the spectra simultaneously to the to the to the population. And um, from what I understand, I think if you if you stand for those cases, um, I think it is able to to uh, overcome those degeneracies. And but yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. But I guess stand is slower than this, so you lose out there. A little bit. Yeah. But, well, I guess it depends on the the case. But yeah. Easier problems are always quicker. So, what can you do? Yeah, true. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, just comment on this easy problems. Uh, I have a general comment. So, if somebody has an easy problem, you just have to use the standard methods. Don't go for the you know, most complex uh, analysis you can imagine, just use, you know, the standard uh, approaches. It all depends on the complexity of your data and your model, I guess. I, yeah, I, yeah, I think so. If there are if there are no other questions, then I guess we could call it a day. Um, if anyone does have uh, any questions or any problems that they experience with the exercises, uh, please do let me know. I plan on leaving this this website just um, yeah just leaving it, <laughs> so it will be available uh, in the future. Um, so yeah, just if you get run into any problems, just let let me know or Ask me or Johannes or yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks.
Thanks, ag thanks again, Peter. Uh, to remind everyone else that we have Rafael Martinez Galarza is going to join us in about seven or eight minutes to do a Chandra Source catalog uh, tutorial. Thank you again for this uh, tutorial, and I 